well, if Cameron can get it for, to work for a psychiatric patient, well, then they can use the same thing to, to deprogram somebody and put them back together for a brainwashing scenario. It would not be until years later, after an emotional divorce from her husband and the painful loss of custody of her children, that Linda McDonald would learn of the hidden purpose behind the treatment she had received. This big headline saying, Dr. Cameron, uh, CIA, brainwashing experiments, and I stopped breathing for a minute. Um, you could have knocked me over. I couldn't... I knew Dr. Cameron was my doctor. I knew I had been at the Allen Memorial. But up until that moment, I believed, because that's what I was told, that the doctor had fixed me, had done to me great things and I was lucky that he had been my doctor so I couldn't I couldn't not read the article and as I read it I became I was just horrified my participation in it was in terms of trying to evaluate the behavior that it was described I don't think I can add anything that uh, uh, that hasn't already been uh, frankly, it's an area I don't like to talk about. It's not that I... but I don't like to talk about it. This is the Allen Memorial Institute in Montreal, one of Canada's most highly respected psychiatric hospitals. In 1956, the director of psychiatry here was Dr. Ewan Cameron, one of the country's most highly regarded psychiatrists. Patients were referred to him by doctors from all over the world. Dr. Cameron was doing research of his own in the field of brainwashing, he was fascinated by the mind control he had heard described in countries behind the Iron Curtain. The CIA was fascinated too. The court case alleged that the CIA backed Dr. Cameron's horrific experiments, experiments that were conducted on more than 70 patients, forcing them to endure three tormenting phases of so-called treatment. First, according to the complaint, Dr. Cameron and others would give patients mind-altering drugs like LSD and angel dust, they would mask them and force them to inhale laughing gas. They would give them high voltage electric shocks several times a day, effectively turning the patients into vegetables. Once the patients were immobilized, Dr. Cameron would play what were called psychic driving tapes, messages that were repeated up to half a million times. Finally, Dr. Cameron would put the patients to sleep with massive amounts of barbiturates. These sleep episodes could last 50 days or longer. They took me in a room outside the ward, in a very little room, and they put three or four pillows at the end of the bed, and there were four doctors at the end of the bed there, and one doctor was uh, putting me a mask there. The doctor started from left to right there, uh, telling me, kill him, 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 kill him. What did they want to make me kill? I'll never know. <laughs> they never told me, I don't know. By the early 1970s, word of the CIA's mind control atrocities began to leak out to the public. An investigation was launched, resulting in the creation of one presidential commission and two Senate committees. And my feeling now is that the CIA had overall powers that put them in a different situation than other people. The American public was in shock. I am terribly upset that the system is such that what happened could happen. Their search for answers, however, would soon hit a dead end as investigators learned that Dr. Sidney Gottlieb had destroyed the majority of the documents relating to the MK Ultra program. It was now impossible for the American public to discover the truth about what the CIA learned from its mind control research. Officially, the agency's position would be that 30 years of aggressive experimentation had yielded few, if any, productive results. Reaper, Reaper, Reaper! You know what day it is today, Cap? Yeah. What? Oh, oh. What day of the week? Wait a minute, wait a minute. Don't okay. bug me. Sir Han's own diary does repeatedly refer to mind control. You say that Sir Han was programmed, controlled, almost brainwashed to kill Robert Kennedy. It sounds like science fiction. As a matter of fact, it sounds like you watched the Manchurian Candidate movie one time too many. What people don't understand about the Manchurian Candidate theory and the movie 
is that that movie was based on Condon's conversations, as I understand it, with people who were actually involved in CIA mind control research. But if one concedes that a hypno-programmed assassin is a possibility, what evidence is there that Sirhan was in some sort of trance at the time of the murder? I think the best evidence for Sirhan's hypno-programming comes from, uh, first of all, his behavior before, during, and after the crime. This, this spacey demeanor and uh, his chills afterwards, his blocking when, sensation when being interrogated. Uh, there's the fact that he was the perfect hypnotic subject, and that was easily demonstrated by his doctors. And uh, then there is the bizarre fact that he genuinely could not recall the crime, how he got there, uh, how the shooting unfolded. So that the tracks of programming um, really seem to be there in Sirhan's behavior and memory loss. Witnesses in the pantry at the Ambassador Hotel would seem to support Dr. Melanson's conclusions. During the shooting itself, Sir Han summoned extraordinary strength as he fought Roosevelt Greer and Rafer Johnson, who were unable to pry the gun from his hand for almost 40 seconds. Feats of unusual strength are often associated with hypnotic trances. Yet despite the shooting and the struggle that followed, onlookers were taken aback by the contented look on the gunman's face. In the Manchurian Candidate, robot assassin Raymond Shaw commits murder without any memory of his deed. As a cinematic plot device, this is perfectly acceptable. But otherwise, it's a very bizarre notion. Yet here, in the person of Sir Han, we have this unlikely circumstance. A perpetrator caught gun in hand who apparently, genuinely, cannot remember anything about the murder. He never claimed that he didn't do it. He didn't say he shouldn't be punished. He says only that he cannot remember. His memory of the evening stops as he is having coffee with a pretty girl and begins again with people pounding on him after the shooting. Listen to the plaintive words of the defendant's mother, Mary Sirhan. I asked him, I said, son, will you tell me why did you do that? His tears began to drop. He said, mama, I'm sorry. I don't remember anything. I was told that I killed Senator Robert Kennedy. The defendant's inability to recall anything about the assassination led to a most bizarre scene in Sir Han's jail cell before the trial, as Dr. Seymour Pollock, psychiatrist for the prosecution, and Dr. Bernard Diamond, psychiatrist for the defense, together hypnotized Sir Han in an effort to get him to remember the crime. Can you see Kennedy coming? Now, what do you see, Sir Han? You're back in the kitchen. Now, what do you see? Sir Han. What's he doing here? What? That son of a bitch. You son of a bitch. You're talking to Kennedy. He's coming. Reach for your gun, Sir Ann. It's your last chance, Sir Ann. Reach for your gun. Where is your gun? Where is your gun? Reach for it. Reach for it, Sir Ann. Reach for your gun. Reach for your gun. Sam, take the gun out and shoot it. Who are you shooting, Sam? Who are you shooting? Uh, you're, you're shooting Kennedy now, huh? Of course, one might wonder at what point a session like this stops becoming a search for recollection and instead becomes a memory implant. Listen as Sir Han is being brought out of his trance. Sir Han, you at once to remember the shooting of Kennedy. You wanted to remember your shooting. Now you'll remember shooting. You'll remember taking the gun out, pulling the trigger again and again and again. You'll remember all of this. You'll remember all of it. All of this will get clearer and clearer, become clearer and clearer, and you'll remember all of it. But as a subsequent solo interview with prosecution psychiatrist Dr. Seymour Pollock reveals, the forces against Sir Han's remembering were so strong as to resist even this hypnotic suggestion. In my opinion, Sir Han, I don't think you have any chance. I really don't. I don't. Because the jury listening 
will be negative rather than positive to you if you don't remember. Now, I say this, and I don't want you to fake. I don't want you to make up anything. You hypnotize me, and whatever I say under hypnosis, or under this truth sign, whatever the hell it is, I will say it when I'm conscious. But uh, right now, as I speak to you about myself, mm -hmm. I have no recollection. The thing that bothers me is that you say you don't even remember any part of it, anything you've written there. Not a single damn thing. That bothers me. How could you carry a gun from your car back to um, the Ambassador Hotel and not know that you have it?